amazing. It's all in the films that we've made. You can see it all happening. But we started writing to everyone. And quite quickly, we started getting letters back. And the first really important letter was from Dr. Oscar Arias, who in fact had actually created a Nightmare Day piece in 1981. Said it didn't have a fixed calendar date, and it didn't ask anybody to stop writing. So nobody really knew about it. But because he was intrigued by the idea of a ceasefire and non-bias with a fixed cut of the day, he invited me to Costa Rica. And I sat down with him and we talked about it and it was amazing. He was this Nobel laureate, this president, taking it seriously. I'd had a free ticket and, you know, it was just it was beautiful. And he said, mate, this is a really good idea. We've got to see if we can try and make that happen. And then suddenly we got some support. And then I received a letter from the Dalai Lama saying, yeah, and he's saying, would you come to India? I want to talk about this type of thing. That's pretty much what we I mean, it didn't really say it like that, but it was kind of like that. Anyway, we found ourselves in India, and there I was in front of the Dalai Lama, and he thought the idea was, well, he just thought it was right. He was like, man, we should have a day where we come together as one, where we unite, and I want to support you. And I remember going home, and a few days later, I remember being home, we're all celebrating that we've been to see him, etc. And I got a phone call from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office saying that the Prime Minister had received a letter from the Dalai Lama saying, I think you should be supporting this day. And he was CC'd, and there were 14 other heads of state that he'd written to, one incredible man. And it started to sort of really build momentum. At the same time, let me just watch the time, at the same time, we were going into places like Somalia. And, 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 and it was in Somalia that, in fact, everything really changed for me. Because if I'm truthful, when we started out on the journey, it wasn't really important to me at the time whether we succeeded in creating the Day of Peace or not. The point was that we were going to try. And in relation to this book that I read by Gandhi saying an experiment with truth, it was like that was what we was doing. It was just like we were going to try and climb the mountain, but irrespective of whether we got to the top or not, it didn't actually really matter. But what happened in Somalia did make me realize that we had to get to the top. I was shocked, like seriously shocked by what I saw. And at that point, I said this to you, know, I cannot go on this journey thinking that I can fail. We have to do this and we have to succeed. And that took me to other places in, all across the Middle East, into Gaza, the West Bank, into Israel, to, uh, 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 around South America, 26 countries of Africa I went to. I mean, we traveled. And I met Mandela, I met Mary Robinson, I met uh, Salim, I met Salim, I met Shimon Perez, I met Eric Musa, I made presentations to the League of Arab States to try and convince them. You know, I mean, it was endless, absolutely endless. And eventually, the British and the Costa Rican governments decided that this day should be created, and they took it forward to the United Nations General Assembly, and Jeremy Greenstock put that forward to a vote, and it was unanimously adopted by every member state of the United Nations. We now have... Well, thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, but we now have this day of peace, the 21st of September. And that was, if you like, stage one. I don't want to run over, there we go, 11 minutes, that's perfect. Stage one, 11 minutes, then we'll get through the others, and that'll be about right. So, the next stage, given that the day of peace was created, was proving it could work, because I made a film about what I just told you. It was called Peace One Day. And the BBC got behind that film, and I made what's known as a Storyville. A Storyville is the slot that every filmmaker would dream of like, being chosen, selected for. It was a cool slot. And that film was Peace One Day, it was a Storyville, and it told the story of what I've just explained. But when I went out there on the festival circuit for the film, something really worrying happened. And that was like, people were like, didn't believe that the day of peace would actually work. And I was really, like, I was kind of shocked. I mean, I didn't tell you about when the Day of Peace was voted for. Three days later, Kofi Annan had invited me to the New York on the 11th of September. It was voted upon on the 7th of September, 2001. Kofi Annan invited me to the United Nations to, in the morning to announce to the world's press that the Day of Peace had been created. And I stood there at 8.30 in the morning, and of course we were evacuated. The planes had been building, and the announcement of the Day of Peace never, never took place. 
was, it was just unbelievable for the tragedy of that situation and those who lost their lives. I mean, it was, you know, anyway, you can see all of that in the film. But the point was, is that we had completed it and that story was told. And I went out on the road and I showed the film in about 60 or so countries, many more countries it was shown in. And I could hear cynics, and I understand about cynics, I'm, you know, trying to avoid becoming one. You know, and I understand why we, you know, why we sometimes don't believe in things when we have the experiences that we have. But I can hear people saying, it's just a day, it's symbolism, it's meaningless, it will never work. It's just a day, another day. And I was really, like, seriously concerned because I heard from the great thinkers saying to their idea, I see the humanitarians in areas of conflict, I listened to Kofi and Andrew, I was inspired and honoured to have sat with, etc, 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 saying you've got to do this, and I saw the world vote for it. But once it was created, nobody believed in it, or that was what I was hearing. It wasn't actually totally true, of course. So I thought, okay, we've got to go again. We've got to go again, and we've got to prove that this day can work. And so I decided that we would try and make it work in Afghanistan. So, it took about two and a half years of going and visiting and speaking and meeting. And, my, and unfortunately, a good friend, look, I'd learned at that point that if you really wanted to make things happen, the film camera was very, very useful. You know what I mean? It was useful. They, used to, they say the pen is mightier than the sword, and indeed it is. But so is a film camera. If used constructively and peacefully, yeah, it can really open doors in a wonderful way. It was a really supportive tool. And so I decided we'd, we'd take the film camera, and another thing that really helps is the power of sort of celebrity and incredible artists. And fortunately, Jude Law said he'd come with me. <laughs> which was cool, it was helpful, because there were a lot of people who were like, wow, oh yeah, well, I'd love to meet him, you can come in and have a chat. And that was actually quite helpful, because it was like Jude was there, and I was there, and I could ask the question, and Jude, you know, it was a really good, com it was really interesting, and, and, and everything, and, and the people, what basically happened was it started, it just built momentum when we got there, we were meeting everybody. There were some instrumental players that made it a success, the teams from Unama, Fatima Gabani, you know, etc. Uh, some members of civil society, some really extraordinary, courageous, wonderful people. We met everybody that we could. We met the people from NATO and the teams from ISAF, and we met with Karzai and sat down and explained, and you know, we did media, and we started it to look, it was starting to really pick up, and people started to hear about it. And, and, then, and then amazingly, just before the peace day, we received not really knowing whether it was going to, because of course we would go there and then come back and then go there and then come back, hoping that it was going to happen. And I received a fax from the spokesperson of the Taliban saying that we wouldn't kill or kidnap any humanitarian workers on the 21st of September. And as a consequence of that, NATO and ISAF and Karzai, and civil society, and Unama, and those incredibly brave men and women who were working in those places. You know, everybody was on board. And because of that letter, UNICEF, WHO, and other UN agencies were able to mobilize 10,000 vaccinators who went into areas that you couldn't normally go for fear of being kidnapped and killed, and they vaccinated 1.4 million children against polio. An incredible thing, and I made a film about that, and that film was called The Day After Peace. And you may well have seen or not seen that film, but if you haven't seen the film, please see the film. You know, it's on the Peace One Day YouTube channel, and check it out. It helps if you go and just see it, you know. <laughs> but, um, and so that was kind of phase two, you know, phase one was, and actually, this journey is full of phases, isn't it? It's full of very difficult things that come your way unexpectedly, of which you have to dig deep, right? You have to dig deep and, 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 and climb when you fall. And that's, that's what I find sort of most interesting about this experience like this. You know, it's the, the turns of what we 
of, of what that situation then creates for you in order to go on the next phase, you know, with this technology and, and, and how to utilize it to, to bring humanity to, to manifest encounters, etc., etc. I'm really interested in this falling down. I'm really quite interested in it. I'm quite interested in no's, not yeses. No's are the opportunity. They are the moment it becomes interesting. Yes is yes, no is wow. And I, and I, and I just I wanted to operate like that, and I wanted to sort of stay in that space. So the next phase was, is what is, given that the data's been improved, is the institutionalization of it. And also kind of, yeah, just how, how are we going to take this to another level? So I went to Stanford and I spoke to leading statisticians to try and understand, like, okay, so, okay, it's here now, it works, how do we get it really out there? Because one thing, it working, it's another thing everyone knowing about it. I mean, if nobody knows about it, then, then that's it. Nobody knows about it. So we had to go on a process, and that process, quite quickly, I realized that the only way we were really going to be able to do it, as well as survive, because surviving has been a nightmare. I mean, we all know. We all know. Whatever it is we're doing, we're all sat here thinking about surviving. Every single one of us, right? I mean, it's hard. And the org, you know, was, I mean, this was just, a, but this part of it, I just really, it's, it's exhausting, you know, for all of us. I mean, I mean, you know, I don't know what going about it. But that's fine. And so survival was important, but institutionalization was key. And getting to the masses and understanding how to do that. So we started to, the filmmaking was good, but then we started to utilize the music. And we started to get people like Elton John and John Legend and Lenny Kravitz and, you know, doing show with Annie Lennox and Jesse J and goodness knows who, Brian Adams. It goes on and on. I mean, we were working with artists and we would get Angelina Jolie and Jodie Kane and she's supported, she's in the films and she was launching the movies and I started to really work this whole area. You know, I mean, there are four pillars, I think, to a campaign. Four. They're fun. I mean, without any, any one of them you take away, it's over for me anyway, one of them is you've got to have a good idea, you've got to have a constituency, you've got to have money. <laughs> Sorry, I've my mind's gone black for a second. You've got to have a constituency, you've got to have a good idea, you've got to have money, and you've got to be able to raise awareness. Because if you can't raise awareness, it's, it's, uh, and the only way that I can raise awareness, because I would hold a press conference and say, hey, we've done this in Afghanistan, we've done this, nobody would come. But if that Jude Law was with me, or Angelina Jolie was with me, or a big artist was with me, say, hey, I'm going to have a press conference, and Jude's going to be there, then everyone will come. Because, you know, so it's like, when you start to get to know and understand that, don't you? And, every, and we, we see that, and we see that out there. So we were really working that. And of course, by working that at the same time, and then trying to evolve relationships with corporations, and we worked really hard, and, and eventually, Eventually, we were able to convince a corporation to put the Peace One Day logo on the side of their Coca-Cola bottle. It took years to, man to, to, to manifest that. There was lots of corporations, but this was, one of, this was an object that was with arm's reach and desire of so many people. So could it be utilized in a constructive way without any editorial control of what we were doing that would then reach lots of people? And once that started to happen, it, the, a light bulb went on for me and I was like, okay, this is the way to really inform a lot of people. Because believe me, I tried everything else. I kind of almost know what some people might be thinking at this point, and I would be thinking it myself. And this was a real area. This was a, a, a journey of which I went to people like Ray Anderson, who coined the phrase, doing well by doing good, to say, is this right? Is this what I should be doing? Is this the only way? Because I can't get the message out there. I mean, the corporate sector has placed, can play such an incredibly important role in the way in which things happen in the future. They have the money, they have the trust, they have the workforce, they have the consumers. I mean, they're, they're, we just got to work with them. I mean, we, I, I didn't have any choice. I had to work with them. And actually, the wonderful thing is that within corporations, there's just wonderful men and women who are just like you and me, who care and want to change everything, and if spoken to in the right way, we're all identical, ultimately. We all want it. We all want peace, we all want to change things, we all want to go home and our children be proud, etc, etc. That's a wonderful thing and that's actually why there's hope. Yeah, because then we are good people. Yeah, there's just fear, it kicks in, it points, and people can say things 
and do things in those moments of fear that can have just such a tragic consequence, and we, we know that. And so the corporate sector was, uh, was really great, and great examples of getting the message out there is one of them is there. Another one was working with Paul Polman of Unilever on the Make Love Not War campaign in 54 countries, 72 million pounds spent over the Super Bowl. I mean, amazing. Millions of people, millions. You know, another one was the Mwapa, Mwapa campaign you might have heard of, Burger King and McDonald's making peace. I mean, it was massive. 40% of Americans in the course of that year knew it was peace day. We'd actually worked with John Kerry to make sure that 21st of September was America's peace day, not only the UN's peace day. And we got it unanimously passed through Congress for obvious reasons. <laughs> it was good. So that was kind of like, that was the sort of phase three, is the institutionalization of the day and letting it live by itself and having its own journey. And the reason why that was important is that what I started to learn because of institutionalization is about an organization called McKinsey. And many of you might know who they are. I didn't know who they were until a few years ago. But what I did find out is that they measured things. And that was really interesting to me because if they could measure the amount of people that were involved on the day, and if they could measure what the impact of that was, then it was going to be a game-changing moment in relation to the evolution of that day, if it really was, if it was kind of working. Because on Mother's Day, or on Valentine's Day, or on important days, behaviour happens. I give my mum flowers, I'm really polite. I'm actually polite, I do, I love my mum, but you know what I mean. We get into behavioural change, things happen. And so, could it be that on peace day, the behavioural change is that we're more peaceful, and that we say sorry, and that there's a decrease of violence on that day? And after years of working that out with McKinsey's, we were measuring three things, exposure, awareness, and behavioural change. And by the end of the measurement in 2016, we measured 2.2 billion people in 2016, more now. 2.2 billion people were exposed to the 21st of September. That's in 2016. Much bigger because Facebook now got behind it, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, so 2.2 billion people exposed. In terms of awareness, 940 million people are fully aware that the 21st of September is a day of peace. And then in terms of behavioral change, 17 million people not involved in violence when they would have been. 17 million people not involved in violence when they might have been, as a consequence of a day of ceasefire and non-violence. And that was kind of just like really interesting, that we were starting to understand that the 21st of September is the day when more people think about peace than any other day of the year. It's also the day where there's the greatest reduction of violence. And, I've, and, and that, was, that was really interesting in terms of the sort of final part of where we're going. But before I tell you the final part, I'd just like to show you a little film that brings some of this story to life that I've just told you. And if we could play that film, that'd be amazing. Thank you. My name's Jeremy. I'm an independent documentary filmmaker and the founder of Peace One Day. In July 1998, I decided to make a film about peace. Then I realized there was no day of peace. That was it. I was gonna try and establish the first ever annual peace day. A day of global ceasefire and non-violence. A day for everyone to become involved in the peace process. The office was a spare room in my mum's house. I had a computer, a telephone, and a handful of committed friends to help out. Over the next three years, I traveled the world to build the case working with the United Nations, governments, Nobel Peace Laureates, humanitarian organizations, and those living in conflict zones. If there is a cessation for a day, then it gives us an opportunity to move supplies safely through places that are otherwise difficult. Through time, I think it will become more and more better. What do you think? To come to 100%, you need a lot of time. But I think the great thing is at least we've done something for the next generation. Any moment that we can get the combatants to pause, to think, and reflect on what they are doing to their own people and to the environment will be a great achievement, and I will support it 100%. In September 2001, 
the member states of the United Nations unanimously adopted a peace day, a day of ceasefire and non-violence, the 21st of September annually. It was incredible. It was originally brought to our attention by a UK-based organisation, Peace One Day. It is so decided. The next challenge was to prove that they could really work by stopping the fighting in a conflict zone so that humanitarian action could take place. An old friend, Jude Law, wanted to help. After a further three years of campaigning, that goal became a reality in Afghanistan, where in 2007, due to everybody's hard work, particularly in the United Nations, peace day agreements were reached with all sides, including the Taliban. As a result, 10,000 health workers were able to vaccinate 1.4 million children against polio on peace day. The UN also announced in Afghanistan on that day that there was a 70% reduction of violent incidents. It was amazing. The cynic used to say the more difference is a day now. What I saw in Afghanistan was, uh, well, the difference is life or death. But whilst peace day is a day of ceasefire, it's also a day of non-violence, when individuals can come together to make peace. In fact, 97% of the world's violence happens in our communities, our schools, our homes, places of work. Consequently, we reach out to all sectors of society to ask everyone to become involved. <laughs> Providing free educational tools, building coalitions of corporations, NGOs and others, creating sport, music, dance initiatives, holding peace day celebrations featuring major artists. These are some of the many ways we spread the message. I do see uh, the possibilities of change and I think people need to be lifted at times. Uh, hope is a great energizer. I'm delighted that Unilever is a founding member of the Peace One Day Corporate Coalition. Who will you make peace with on the 21st of September? The institutionalization of Peace Day is working. Because of everybody's hard work, we're now confident that in 2016, an estimated 2 billion people have been exposed to the day. The 21st of September is the day when there's the greatest reduction of violence. Peace Day is bringing the world together, and that's peace building. The International Day of Peace is a time for reflection, a day when we reiterate our belief in non-violence and call for a global ceasefire. I call on all of us to think how we can contribute to building a culture of peace in our homes, schools, and communities. So who will you make peace with on Peace Day, 21st of September? Please follow us on Twitter, join us on Facebook, and get involved. By working together, there will be peace one day. going on and therefore we all really have a role to play 
We don't need to look over there. We just need to look here and kind of go, right, who can I make peace with on the 21st of September? I mean, you know, we want to do that every day. But the 21st of September is a wonderful opportunity for an encounter team on a massive scale. Yeah. And I think that what's wonderful is that we, you know, get involved in that. If you would, and I know you will, and I'm sure many of you already have, but that'd be a really great thing that on the 21st of September we make a commitment to do something on the day with our families, our friends, our work colleagues, our communities, and that Finland, this incredible, peaceful, beautiful country, you know, um, really, you know, so it goes for it, you know, and inspires the youth to know that it's exist, that it's real. You know, there's free resources, all sorts of organizations have free resources, but Peace One Day has them too. For the teachers and for the parents that want to use them, and, you know, whether we're playing football or singing or dancing or speaking, whatever it is on that day. But if you, you know, let's work, you know, towards doing it. And I know that, you know, CMI, I'm sure, will, you know, will, will make that happen too. I, I, I'm also really interested in the sustainable development goals. I mean, I just think the Sustainable Development Goals, the Global Goals, are absolutely just the most wonderful opportunity to ignite, you know, something in us in all kinds of different ways because different goals are going to mean things to different people. And I think that's really, uh, just, uh, I just think it's one, I think it's really interesting and I'm particularly interested in Goal 70, Partnerships for the Goals. Because it's all about encounters. Yeah, that's what a partnership is about. It's an encounter. And so I'm really hoping that on the 21st of September, you would be, you know, be involved and say, okay, I'm going to partner with someone, with an organization, different universities, different corporations, different NGOs, and we're all going to talk about each other. We've partnered with the Alliance for Peace Building in Washington, an incredibly established organization. We've just partnered with World Cleanup Day on the 15th of September, very publicly. How, what a wonderful day that is, World Cleanup Day. And so I was saying, listen, this is about picking, picking up the pieces of broken objects on the 15th of September and picking up the pieces of broken relationships on the 21st of September, and there's this wonderful week. Because actually, you can't have peace without sustainability, and you can't have sustainability without peace. They're inextricably linked, and that's why I will want to post a prize for making a film about the environment. Brilliant. So I think that the 21st of September is coming. 15th is World Cleanup Day. 21st of September is Peace Day. You know, with your families and with your friends, you know, it'd be really amazing you know, if you would become involved in that on the 21st of September. So I think that the only other thing that I really want to say is that if you could um, support the, the social media, you know, obviously the Peace One Day, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Jeremy's and uh, Peace Days as well, that that would be really helpful. And, um, you know, I'm just like, you know, totally honoured, like genuinely, you know, as I was watching from up there and I was thinking about encounters and knowing that this room has had I don't know, extraordinary encounters. I mean, look how beautiful it is. And here we are having one, talking about world peace with an incredible man like Timo, with this amazing organization called CMI in a beautiful country of Finland. Thank you very much for letting me talk to you. Thank you.